<laughs> Good evening. It's my privilege to welcome you to the second presentation of the 50th edition of the Barton Clinton Gordy Lecture Series. Over 50 years ago, Dr. Finus Crutchfield, who was a pastor at this church and later was elected a bishop, had the vision that he would have an endowed series that would bring the world's greatest theologians and pulpiteers to this congregation to hear. A few years after he had that vision, it became a fact when the Ellis Barton family gave a major donation to endow a series. Dr. Ellis Barton was a renowned preacher and scholar and he received his first appointment in Oklahoma to this great church. Several years later, the Fred S. and Jane Clinton family contributed, made a major contribution to the series so that the series could be even further enhanced. Dr. Clinton was a noted surgeon, physician uh, in Oklahoma. He established, helped establish the first uh, branch of the American Red Cross in 1906, uh, when it was then Indian Territory. Then a few years ago, the estate of I.V. and Bona Gordy decided that they would contribute to the lecture series, so that enhanced it even further. I.V. Gordy was a member of this great chancel choir for 50 years. In fact, he was their goodwill ambassador. Mrs. Gordy was a uh, mathematician, a teacher in the Tulsa Public Schools, a lecturer at the University of Oklahoma, lecturer at the University of Tulsa, uh, and those of you who have been coming for the last 30 some odd years have heard me say from this pulpit almost every year that Ms. Gordy was my eighth grade algebra teacher. She taught me algebra two blocks north of here at Horseman <laughs> Junior High School. That uh, high school now is a parking lot. She and I didn't have anything to do with that, but <laughs> Horseman Junior High School was never the same after Ms. Gordy and I spent a year in eighth grade algebra. <laughs> Now, you know that these visions of all these people that uh, uh, were willing to contribute, and those of you who have come every year, have allowed us to have this great series. We're one of the last remaining lecture series in the country, and one of the very biggest. None of this happens without a cast of characters. Uh, it takes a lot of people to do this. So let me introduce to you quickly some of the people that it takes to do it. The committee members, my wife, Marilyn. Marilyn, would you stand, please? Jerry and Nancy Hudson, and I believe they're right out here somewhere in the front, or they're right here, and Pam and Terry Carter. Terry's with us this evening. Also, we're greatly indebted to our church administrator, Brenda Reed. Brenda makes one of the most important things happen. Brenda makes sure that the receptions are in place every evening, the cookies and the people to serve the cookies. So, Brenda, we thank you for that. And, of course, what would we do without Joe Pansera and Susan Pansera and this great chancel choir? What a dimension they add to this particular series. Let's give them a big hand. I want you to note that Joel takes this opportunity every year to lead us into some different hymns. Joel's endeavoring to broaden our horizons. And as I sit here this, uh, this evening, I think he's broadened some of yours. I don't think he did much for mine, but he's done. <laughs> Joe, we appreciate that. It's a good opportunity. And of course, none of this cast of characters works without our director. And our director is Dr. Biggs. For 32 years, Dr. Biggs has brought to this committee, excuse me, has brought to this committee a list of people that we could choose from. He takes suggestions from the congregation, he listens to people, he reads, he hears, he gives it to the committee, and then the committee does their research and makes that choice. So we're greatly indebted to Dr. Biggs for what he does for this. Without him, none of it would happen. So let's give him a big hand, too. <laughs> Dr. Biggs told you this morning that each evening or uh, each, uh, each one of the uh, presentations that one of the committee members would briefly introduce the speaker. And Dr. Biggs, I apologize for the brevity here, but I'm going to divulge from, I'm going to diverge from what we're doing for just a minute and say something else to you. Uh, two months ago, uh, it was announced that Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University had, put, had bestowed the 2012 Distinguished Alumni Award on Dr. Biggs. That was in the paper, that was in the church paper, it was online. Dr. Biggs quietly, and he and his family quietly accepted that and didn't say much about it. With one exception, he did say that he would have never received that award if it had not been for 
32 years at this pulpit. I think we ought to give him a standing ovation. Now for this year's presenter, Dr. Walter Brueggemann. I hope all of you were able to pick up one of these brochures at the information uh, uh, stands in each ends of uh, Great Hall. If you weren't, if you haven't, you need to. If you haven't saved your church word, if you haven't looked online uh, to look at the list of accomplishments and the resume of this man, you need to do that. I could take 20 minutes of his time just reading this to you this evening, but I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hit on a few of, few of the brief highlights, and then we'll get to him. <clears throat> Dr. Brueggemann is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, and his life has been devoted to a passionate exploration of the Old Testament theology with an emphasis on the relationship between Old Testament and Christian works. He's authored more than 60 books and numerous articles. He was the professor at Old of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia for 17 years. Before that, he taught from 1961 to 1986 at the Eden Theological Seminary in Webster Groves, Missouri. He has, in addition to, to those jobs, he served as the editor of the Overture series for Fortress Press for 25 years. He's a native of Nebraska. He and his wife, Tia, now reside in Cincinnati. He told me that they needed to move back to the Midwest. And he has two sons, James and John, and they have five grandchildren. Each year, I've endeavored to bring to you something on the personal side of our speaker. It was easier for me to personalize him in some way than to just read these printed words. So I'm going to share a few of those things with you today. First thing I'm going to share with you is when I first met him, I introduced myself and I said, Dr. Brueggemann, it's nice to have you. And he said, my name is not Dr. Brueggemann. He said, it's Walter. So if I slip into calling him Walter for the rest of this presentation, I have license to do that, see? <laughs> he shared with me that he uh, loves classical music. He's already found the classical music station on the radio here in Tulsa, and he keeps it tuned to that so he won't lose it. He also shared with me that he loves to go to the movies, not Netflix or not DVDs, but actually go into the dark theater, he says, and watch the movie. I think that's reminiscent of our own pastor. I believe he loves to do that, too. He also shared with me that he uh, uh, jogs. He loves to, well, that's not right. He didn't say that. He said he hates to jog, but his doctor loves for him to jog. <laughs> he said he enjoys eating. He enjoys uh, napping. And he said he's very proficient at both of those particular things. But the thing that struck me the most is he told me that he was a dyed-in-the-wool St. Louis Cardinal baseball fan, and that makes him all right in my books. <laughs> in just a few moments after the choir presents an anthem, it will be your privilege to hear Walter present the seduction of acclamation. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to, uh, to uh, have uh, this time with you. I was thinking as I uh, thought about you there and you there on Sunday night, which is kind of an old-fashioned practice that you kind of uh, present yourselves and you don't know what you're going to get, because I got the microphone. Uh, and I, I um, am really glad to be with you, and what I think about in my professional life is how do we interpret the Bible in responsible ways so that it has some contemporaneity for us. Uh, I believe that the Bible is an act of imagination that is led by the Spirit, the purpose of which is that we should be able to imagine our lives in ways that we would not imagine our lives if we did not have the Bible because I believe it is imagination in which the Spirit continues to be at work among us. And so what I want to do, and uh, I, I've sort of uh, thought about these three evening presentations uh, as a package, and I'm aware that some of you will be here on Sunday night and uh, not more, 
and uh, we'll miss you. Um, but I'm going to do the abrasive part tonight, like that verse, and then I'll uh, do the good part tomorrow night, and then on uh, Tuesday night, for those of you who show up, we'll think about how do we process that. I'm going to talk about food. I've been thinking about food in the Bible because uh, food touches the questions of how much and in what way shall we produce food, given agribusiness. It touches questions of distribution about who gets what and who decides who gets what. It touches cons uh, questions of consumption about who gets to eat and what shall we eat and how much shall we eat. It touches the care of the earth because the earth is fundamentally a food producing arrangement wrought by God. And I suspect as we think about hunger and world hunger that food is also an image and a metaphor for the hungers that those of us have who have an adequate, reliable food supply. So I mean to be talking in image and metaphor about all of these issues that swirl around food that we sort of acknowledge when we eat by, isn't it a strange expression, we say grace. What an odd way to phrase what we mean as an acknowledgement that this bread in front of us is an awesome testimony to the goodness of God. And then I thought, as I thought about food, that we are always engaged in a food fight. First of all, when I thought food fight, I thought about when you go into a nice restaurant where a family has just been with a bunch of little children and it looks like there was a food fight. Or then I thought about uh, Animal House, in which college is portrayed essentially as a food fight. And then I decided that the food fight in which we are all engaged is a fight between two different practices and two different notions, two different ideologies, two different theologies of food that are in deep conflict in our society. And the reason I take your trouble, your time to trouble you with this is I believe that that food fight is alive and well in most of our persons. Because what I want to talk about is a theology of accumulation and a theology of sharing, of getting all I can for myself and opening all I can to my neighbor and I suspect that some of you are like me, that you vacillate about that from day to day and moment to moment, depending on who's in front of you. So tonight I want to talk about a food theology of accumulation. Tomorrow night I'm going to talk about a food theology of sharing generosity. And then on Tuesday night I'm going to try to talk about how do we adjudicate and process that. So you understand I will be talking about food and I will not really be talking about food. I will be talking about food as a metaphor for this whole business of trying to control life and have it on our own terms for ourselves. And what I want to do is to trace that theology uh, for these minutes uh, through the Old Testament and then tomorrow night I will trace the other theology through and the way I want you to listen is not only to see whether I get these texts right, but to see what's going on in your life and in the church and in the body politic about this deep tension about food and wealth and control and all of those things that are related to it. So uh, theology of food accumulation begins with Pharaoh 
in the Old Testament, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And you may know that seminary teachers have argued forever about whose Pharaoh was it uh, Ramses II or was it Merneptah? Or was it, and it's very interesting that the, that the Bible is not interested in the identity of Pharaoh, unlike seminary teachers, because they figure if you've seen one Pharaoh, you've seen all Pharaohs. <laughs> when you start reading in Genesis 12, which is when Abraham and Sarah and Israel first appear, the second paragraph of Genesis 12 says there was a famine, they ran out of food, so they all went to Egypt because Pharaoh had lots of food because of the Nile. Pharaoh is the guy with the food. In Genesis 41, in the Joseph story, Pharaoh has a nightmare. People who eat too well often have nightmares. And he couldn't figure out what the dream meant. So he asked his whole intelligence community, which characteristically cannot interpret anything. I'll just <laughs> slip that in. And then nobody knew what the dream meant. So he had to find somebody who could interpret the dream. And finally, he found a Jew. Jews have been ter interpreting dreams right up to Sigmund Freud. That's what they do. They, they look for the subtext that is hidden. So they found Joseph the Jew locked up in prison, and they cleaned him up and brought him in front of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh told him his dream, and he said, I don't understand it. I had a dream of six fat cows that were devoured by six lean, shaggy cows, and then I had a second dream of six really good, seven good shocks of wheat, and then seven shocks of blighted, mildewed wheat came and ate them all. And Joseph the Jew said, oh, that's easy. You had a dream about food scarcity. You had a dream about famine. He said, I did? Yes, you did. And you know, it's the way, it's the wor it's the way it works. The people who have the most are the ones who have the nightmare about not having enough, about running out. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, what do you think I ought to do? And he said, I think you ought to appoint a food czar. You ought to get somebody who's really smart. And uh, Pharaoh said, I'm not making this up, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and Pharaoh said, do you have any nominees? And he said, yes, I nominate moi. <laughs> so Joseph became the food czar and the second, was made the second most powerful person in the Egyptian empire. When you go to Genesis 47, a text we never read because it's not nice, we only read nice texts, Joseph the food czar, they had all the food, and there was a famine, and the peasants came for food, and he sold them food. And the second year they came for food, he said, well, you don't have any money. It didn't occur to him to give them food. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take your cattle. Well, you take cattle away from peasants, and you put them out of business. The third year... They came for food, and he said, well, you don't have any money, and you don't have any cattle. I don't know what to do. And they said, why don't you take our land, and why don't you take our bodies, and if you give us food, we will become your slaves. Did you ever think about, when you open the book of Exodus, why the story starts with people in slavery? It's because of shrewd economic dealing. And the text goes on in Genesis 47 to say, So Pharaoh collected all the food, and the peasants said, Thank you so much, Pharaoh. We are so delighted to be your slaves because we will have food. And then there's a cryptic little footnote that says, Pharaoh owned all the land 
<laughs> except the land of the priests because you see some you need some holy people to bless the accumulation and then if you turn two pages you get to the book of Exodus and the first chapter says that Pharaoh treated the slaves brutally and what the slaves were doing was building storehouse cities to store the monopoly of grain that Pharaoh had accumulated. That's how the story of accumulation works in the Bible. And I want to suggest to you that you can track the way policy is formed by saying there was anxiety. That's what the nightmare is about. There was anxiety about scarcity that led to policies of accumulation. And you know it's very dangerous to form policy out of anxiety. And the accumulation led to monopoly of food and land and when anybody gets monopoly of food and land it leads to violence against cheap labor. So that's my gift to you for Lent. Anxiety, scarcity, accumulation, monopoly, violence. Now, the reason I think that's so important for us is that I believe that that ideology of food is very powerful in our society. And we become a society in which social relationships have devolved into violent abusiveness by those who manage the monopoly against those who are dependent upon the monopoly. Now, if you read on in the Old Testament, you will soon come to Solomon, the king. Did you know that Solomon is Pharaoh's son-in-law? So I like to imagine the way uh, Dr. Biggs has his family for lunch. I imagine Pharaoh had his family for lunch. They showed up at, on Sunday, and Pharaoh sort of instructed his son-in-law in how to manage the food monopoly. And he says, I know you, Israel is just a little country. It's not as big as, as Egypt, and you don't have a Nile, but it's the same deal. So what I think is that we in the church have whitewashed King Solomon because he is portrayed as an accumulator. He is a ruthless, greedy accumulator that continues in Israel the practices of his father-in-law, Pharaoh, in Egypt. So if you look at the story in 1 Kings 4, you will have a long paragraph we never read it in church because it is so boring. It's, it's, a, it's a delineation of his 12 tax districts. You can see why we wouldn't read that in church. Because every tax district had to raise enough money to support the royal entourage for one month every year. And it's a very complex, well-ordered system which served to accumulate the money for the urban elite that enjoyed a very good life in Jerusalem. And that is followed in 1 Kings 4 by the catalog of things that the royal entourage ate every day, which says they ate 10 oxen and 10 lambs and ten calves, and it goes on and on, and a partridge in a pear tree. That is, they ate a lot of meat. Peasants don't eat meat. 
but the king could eat meat because the money was flowing to Jerusalem. And then you come in 1 Kings 5 through 7 to these tedious chapters about the construction of the temple, about the Holy of Holies was five cubits by five cubits by five cubits, and the holy place was 17 cubits, and they brought the ark in and had poles on the, on the side of the ark and rings. It's all, it sounds like an Episcopalian wrote it. It's so, uh, <laughs> it's so detailed. But what's interesting about it is that as it describes the construction of the temple, what you can notice is the recurrence of the word gold. Gold doorposts and gold ceilings and gold altar and gold table and gold incense burners and gold snuffers. and It's as though the, the, the writers were saying, why don't you make a long paragraph and please use the word gold 17 times. It's so that Solomon's temple, most interpreters now think, was not a great sanctuary for the people of God. It was a royal showplace for state festivals and self-congratulatory liturgies about how we have arranged all of this to come to us. And then in chapter 9, it is reported that Solomon had forced labor. That's the technical phrase. That means, that means the draft in which men in Israel or men in his colonies were required to work for cheap labor for the state. And the end of chapter 9 says that Solomon was an arms dealer. He shipped horses north, and he took, shipped chariots south, and he collected tariffs. So what you get is this picture of all of this money, and, and it says clothing and spices and gold and silver and every kind of commodity so that Solomon becomes the commodity king who imitates his father-in-law Pharaoh, and then the last chapter about this collector in chapter 11 of 1 Kings said he also collected 300 wives and 700 concubines, which were probably all political arrangements. Wendell Berry has famously said that the way we treat women in society is always closely related to the way we treat land. And if we are exploiters, we will be exploiters of women and land. So Solomon sets this trajectory of accumulation in which the peasant economy of small farmers worked to send all their money to the enhancement of what I suppose we would now call the 1% or something like that. And when you page through the Old Testament, when you come to the prophets that we don't read a lot in church, the prophets issue poetry. It's just, it's just poetry. I don't, I don't believe it's words that came down from the sky. It's just poetry. I, I get around in the church a lot, and I hardly get anywhere that somebody in the assembly doesn't hand me a poem they've just written. Because poetry is always bubbling up from below to invite us to turn the world and see it differently. So in Amos 6, I won't do a lot of that, but in Amos 6, beginning at verse 4, he says, Whoa, that, that means big trouble coming. Whoa, woe to you. And then he describes the accumulators. Woe to you who lounge on beds of ivory 
who drink wine from big bowls and dance to frivolous music. I think Mitt Romney would call that the politics of envy by a poet who doesn't have any ivory bed or big wines of bowl and doesn't get to go to the club every day. And then he says, you who do that but are not grieved over the ruin of Jacob. You in your self-sufficient indulgence of your monopoly of food haven't noticed that your society is going to hell in a handbasket. That's what he says. And then when you read the prophets, when you come to therefore, always duck because he says, therefore, you, you woe people, you will be the first who are deported from your wealth. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think you have to take those texts with utter seriousness. I just think they're poems that sit there, and from time to time they haunt God's people with the notion that the practice of food as anxiety, scarcity, accumulation, monopoly, violence, that that practice of food will lead to social loss and social chaos and social displacement. When you come to the far end of the Old Testament, many people think that the book of Daniel is the latest book in the Old Testament, probably written 150 years before the time of Christ. Uh, it uses the, 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 the book of Daniel uses the names of Babylonian kings, even though there were no Babylonian kings for several centuries. It talks about Nebuchadnezzar and it talks about his son Belshazzar. And in Daniel 5, Belshazzar is throwing a banquet kind of the way we do that on a nice night for our best friends. And you can tell that the narrative wants to make fun of this process because the way you make fun in that old Hebrew is that you pile up nouns and adjectives. So it said the princes and the satraps and the oligarchs and the rich people and the soldiers and the generals and all the power people were assembled and the orchestra came in and they had flutes and drums and trombones and pianos and organs. Did they have organs then? Organs. And, and, and so it's just wonderful for three verses. And when you get to verse 4, as they were all seated there, probably by that time half sober, there was this handwriting on the wall. And of course, there wasn't supposed to be any handwriting on the wall, and, and we don't know how it got there. But the narrative wants to say, you cannot seal yourself off in your monopoly because the truth of the world will get through. And he couldn't read the stuff that was written on the wall because it was written in Aramaic. Lots of political leaders can't read. So he got all of his intelligence community and said, read that. And they said, I don't, I don't know those words. I quit building vocabulary when I was in the sixth grade, and I don't know those words. So he had to find a Jew. <laughs> What'd you think? You got, you got Daniel. Daniel's a really smart Jew who's a kind of a model for how to work it as a Jew in the world. Oh, he said, I can read that. That's Aramaic. I said, I know that. What does it say? It says time and time and half a time. What's that mean? 
What's that Aramaic? He said, I know that. It means, O oh king, the time is running out on you. And it does not surprise you then that if you read to the end of Daniel 5, it says, that night Belteshazzar died. Now, it's, it's just a story. I don't, I don't think that story has any historical foundation. But it's a story to tease our imagination when we are caught in the ideology of scarcity and monopoly and we think it's a kind of an absolute state for us, there comes this penetration from God that says, enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. It's so close to the end because your accumulation and your monopoly will cannot be sustained in the world where Yahweh is King of kings and Lord of lords because no man works like him. Now if you run into the New Testament, as you know, the Gospel of Luke begins with the song of Mary called the Magnificat. The Song of Mary is the most dangerous text in the Bible. And I, I spent some, some uh, sabbaticals in Cambridge, England, and, and I couldn't believe it at King's College Chapel where I went regular for even song. In, in that luxurious chapel, they sang the Magnificat like they didn't notice what was being said. Because what Mary says is that God will keep God's promises and he will fill the hungry with good things and send the rich empty away. And this becomes the launching pad for the Gospel of Luke, which is probably the most socially active gospel in which Jesus is most engaged with the marginal, vulnerable people in society. And in Luke 12, this is a last text that I will cite, a man comes up to Jesus and he says, uh, Teacher, Rabbi, my brother and I are arguing about who gets the family farm. Any of you, any of you grow up in a rural community? What big families do in rural communities argue about who gets the farm. Would you, would you work that out for us, Jesus? And uh, Jesus says, well, I'm not a probate judge. I'm a rabbi. And what rabbis do is tell, I will tell you a story. How's that? And I, I'm sure the guy said, oh, for God's sake, I didn't what I wanted. So Jesus says, you know this parable, there was a man, there was a farmer, who was a very successful farmer. And good farmers are always buying more land. And good farmers are always growing more crops. And he had to tear down his, does, does this sound like anybody in the Old Testament? He had to dare, tear down his storehouses to build bigger storehouses. We call that the World Bank to store his monopoly of grain and wealth and power and prestige. And then, as you know, he said to himself, I think I'll throw a party and eat and drink and be merry. It's very interesting. He said to himself, he didn't have any neighbors. He had eliminated all of his neighbors. So he had to say it to himself. It must have been a hell of a party. <laughs> and then you know what happened. In the night, a voice came into his bedroom. He thought, he thought his bedroom was sealed off. He probably had security guards. 
But the voice is the same guy that did the handwriting in Daniel. The voice said, idiot? No, no, fool? <laughs> like, how stupid can you get to think that your life consists in accumulation and monopoly that amounts to violence against your neighbor? You're going to die tonight. And who do you think is going to get all this stuff? Bing. And then Jesus, who is the perfect seminary teacher, who we all try to imitate, spots this as a critical incident, that's what we call it. And he turned to his disciples, and what you do with a critical incident, you say, well, what do you think is going on here? And the disciples are very good. They know, like all students, Avoid eye contact. Yeah. So they don't say anything. And this is where he delivers his famous line, I tell you, do not be anxious. Don't worry like the guy in the parable worried, like Pharaoh worried. Like all accumulators worry, I haven't published enough articles yet. Well, we don't have enough members or enough dollars or enough cars or enough beer or enough oil or enough cosmetics. Don't worry about what you eat or what you wear or where you live. Think about the flowers. Think about the lilies. Think about the birds. They're not devoured by anxiety, he said. And then he said, well, you know what he said, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his affluence was as well off as a darn blue jay. Well, you think it's accidental that Solomon's name showed up? This is one of only two times that Jesus mentions the name of Solomon. So what I've decided in Jesus' imagination, this is my idea of it, the guy in the parable is Solomon. Solomon is the guy that tore down his barns and his storehouse cities to build bigger ones to accumulate more to contain the monopoly. And all of his hustling for monopoly caused him to die in the night. Now, I take your time with this just so you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not proposing something liberal against conservatism. I'm uh, not advocating socialism. I'm not advocating anything. But I assume that some of you are like me, and you worry about running out and having enough and getting an advantage, or keeping an advantage that you have against your neighbor. What the Bible knows is that this is a human condition. And what the Bible knows, all the way back to Pharaoh and Solomon, is that not only is it a human condition, but we create political structures and economic policies that are grounded in this taxonomy. And if I read the Bible rightly, the Bible is suggesting that this taxonomy is a program of death. And the reason I think we have to think about that, we liberals and we conservatives, is that we're all enmeshed in it. And we watch our children and our grandchildren getting enmeshed in it. And for those of us, for those of us for whom it works, it feels pretty good. Tomorrow night, what I want to talk about is what I think is the 
evangelical alternative to that. And what I'm going to propose for the next two nights is that Lent is a season to ponder the extent to which we've signed on, we in our society, have signed on for this theology of food and the extent to which the gospel invites us to an alternative practice of food and wealth and power. So I have come to think that the Bible is a, an arena in which this contest between these theologies is being worked out. And the reason I think that's so important is that we've been taught in the church to think that the Bible is one seamless teaching and it all fits together. It doesn't. The Bible is filled with interpretive conflict about what is the truth to which we could sign on our life. And one proposal of truth that is there in the Bible is if you hustle, you can join the accumulation and you can arrive at monopoly. That's one side of the text. Those tend not to be the texts that we read in church. But there they are because the Bible knows about us. And I suppose, I, I don't feel like critiquing Hollywood, but I suppose if you go home and turn on the Oscars, uh, you might get glimpses of that ideology being performed on our liturgies in our living room tonight. And the challenge of Joseph and Amos and Daniel and Jesus is given those systemic realities, how do we maintain a gospel identity so that our identity isn't derived from such systemic practices? I believe it is a question that now must haunt the church.